Good morning everyone, Jordan here from Artisan Electrics. Welcome back. And I've got a special guest with me today. This is my friend Chris. He's originally from South Africa, but he's uh, living down south at the moment. We go back quite a few years. We've known each other, worked together on various projects, and he's helping me out on this Zappi installation today. So I um, hope you all enjoy the video. If you do, don't forget to hit a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss out. Let's show you what we're up to. So we've got the car here. It's a lovely uh, mini, electric mini. Just arrived yesterday. And it's a workplace charging job today. So we've got um, this car garage, basically. And I'm gonna be installing the Zappi here on the wall. It's a tethered Zappi. I'm gonna put it here. And then basically he's gonna park the mini where I've got my van at the moment and we've got a distribution board just on the other side of that wall so i'll show you that so here's the db uh, it's an old clipsaw one so i managed just to scrounge a breaker off uncle phil which is going to be arriving soon uh, so we're going to put a new circuit in the distribution board here and then basically run the cable just to there on the wall and drill through into the back of the zappi. It's sort of the shortest cable run that you could ever uh, imagine really. So should be fairly straightforward. We've got to put a little mid meter in as well so that they can monitor the electricity usage and then he can pay his boss back for the electricity. So we're gonna be putting a little Hager enclosure there with a Rolex mid meter um, and just running it in armored cable. In terms of main bonding, we've got a main bond up here for the steel work. There's no water bond to worry about because there's no water coming into this side of the building. Uh, we've got a three phase supply here and it is PME. TNCS. Um, we've got spare ways here in the consumer unit so what we've got to do is decide which phase to go off with the charger obviously trying to maintain as much balance on the phases as possible so we'll do a rough calculation of maximum demand across the various phases and then figure out which one is the best to connect to. A uh, little observation here, looks like the main tails come in and they don't have any slots in between them so could be an issue with eddy currents there but um, just one of those things. Doesn't look like much space to come out the bottom of the board so I think we're going to have to come out the top of the board and then run the cable down, um, just down the wall here. We'll run into the meter here and then go out the back of the meter through into the charging point on the other side of the wall. It's quite a spaghetti, but not as bad as I expected. So on the red phase, there's only socket, uh, sockets in the office and the workshop lights, and then everything else is three phase circuit, so it's all well balanced. So I think the red phase will be the best option for us to put it onto. Um, in terms of loading, we've got a 10 amp three phase circuit, a 32 amp three phase circuit, a 40 amp three phase circuit. 40 amp single phase circuit which goes to another distribution board. That's on the blue phase though. Three phase, 10 amp circuit, and then we've got 6, 6, 16, 16, 32, 32, 16. Um, these two 32s are radials for sockets in the office and the workshop. And then the rest is just lighting basically and an alarm so it's not gonna take much power. So what we can do is run off either this spare way here on the red phase or this spare way here. And we can run the cable out the top here. Yeah, I'll probably put the cable in the top here and then I'll run off this, uh, this spare way here. And it's just a nice easy run out then out with the cable clip it along behind these around here and then just down the wall to the to the enclosure for the meter 
and then from the enclosure to the meter for the meter out to the charging point. It's a bit dusty in this board, so uh, might get a Hoover and just Hoover this out a little bit, clean it up while we while we've got it off. I'm not sure what all these connector blocks are in here. It's a bit a bit of dodgy extension has gone on at some point. And this flexi conduit here has got like about 12 wires in it. <laughs> so it's pretty crammed. Um, but apart from that, everything looks pretty reasonable for a, an industrial installation of this kind of nature. So can't complain too much. Charge is gonna go on here. We'll probably just center it and put it at about this kind of height. The regulations say it should be between 0.75 and 1.2 meters, ideally for the height of the, the display. So that works out to be about here. And I've just got from Uncle Phil, my circuit breaker has arrived. So good old Uncle Phil, I only called him yesterday morning in a bit of a flap because I didn't have a circuit breaker. <laughs> And fortunately, he had a Clipsal 40 amp circuit breaker in stock. So hopefully it's uh, the right fit, but I'm pretty sure it should be. Wow, it's very well packaged. Look at that. Brand new Clipsal circuit breaker, B40 amp. That looks like the right one, so that's perfect. So I'm going to get this zappy open. And then um, just offer it up on the wall. These templates are fantastic because you just literally stick it up like that, mark your holes. That's the cable entry hole, which is perfect as well. And then you can just drill the holes and bang the thing up on the wall, it's super, super easy with this. It just makes it, makes it super easy. Okay, so 0 0.75 is there, 1.2 is there. I think the regulations are for the display on the in itself to be mounted between those, those heights. Obviously it looks quite low, but that's for disabled people to be able to access them as well. So I'm gonna put it like 1.2 to the top. I think the only thing with that is the cable entry on the other side is going to be quite low so we've got to check that it's not going to clash with anything and then basically just make it center of this kind of brick column so that will be about right and then with the template you can just level it and then the good old Pika pencil just mark the holes so what I'll do now is just measure this side, the height of the cable entry hole. So it's about 88 centimeters from the floor here. I wanna just check the other side of the wall to make sure that if I drill through, it's not gonna hit something. Basically it's just below the window sill level. So that gives me a visual indicator because I don't know the floor height on the other side. And then from the brick uh, frame, window frame here, which lines up with the bricks on the inside, it's 30 centimetres. So 30 centimetres and about uh, 10 centimetres below the window sill. Let's have a look on the other side. We were just joking about the fact that Thomas Nagy now has this uh, nice assistant with him. And Chris is my beautiful assistant today. So, um, yeah. So 80, basically it's, it's gonna work out just behind where this meter is. So we're gonna need to actually drill up at an angle and then we'll come out, we'll come out about right. What I might actually do though is just drill from this side because it's gonna be easier to be more accurate and it comes out here, 30 centimeters is about here. So if we drilled here at a slight angle down then that should bring us out in about the right place so I think that's probably what I'll do
Chris just mentioned to me that this looks a bit like a toilet seat. I never thought about that before, but it's true. It's just like lifting the toilet seat. <laughs> so I was just saying that they provide these seven mil plugs, the brown plugs. And I always struggle to find a seven mil drill bit. I've either got an eight or a six. Um, but I'm sure I must have one somewhere in the van. I need to scratch around and find it. But the hole here is um, just in the right place. I did drill a pilot, which came out a little bit lower. So when I drilled the big hole, I just angled it slightly higher up and we've come out almost perfectly where we needed to. So that's great. So I'm just gonna get the fixing holes drilled, get it mounted on the wall. These little small screws in the packet here are, um, are to screw this back plate on. So this back plate is basically to make it nice and smooth behind for the tethered cable. If you don't put that on, then the tethered cable is just going to rub against the wall. So it's important that you put this on before you mount it to the wall. And it's something that I always forget and I've spoken to other installers about it as well. And they, they've said the same thing that they they always forget to put it on, so just a little reminder if you're doing these. Always stick this on first. Right, so we're just going to update the firmware on the hub now and I just want to show you how to do this. So basically what we do is we press and hold this little download button until the server LED goes white and then we let go and then basically that will start downloading the latest firmware. It can take a while so it's worth to do that as soon as you get to site just plug the hub straight into the router power it up and then do the download and then after half an hour or something you'll have firmware updates. So these are the Nipix installation pliers. Um, I've seen these put out on Instagram and stuff loads. People have been raving about them so I went and got myself some. They basically do like pliers grips, stripping tool and cutters and ferrule crimpers all in one. So I thought that maybe they were a bit of a gimmick, but actually so far I'm really enjoying them. And I like this because you've got this little catch on these ones. So you can close the catch and it just leaves it large enough open for you to really quickly do little kind of, ah, delivery. <laughs> little Hager enclosure for the meter that'll be nice a nice neat place to put the meter and then this is the meter itself never used one of these before it's a Rolex single phase mid meter din mountable it says Rolex but it's actually got Yong Tai Long on the front of it so you can guess where that's been made um, but yeah should do the trick just to monitor accurately the amount of electricity that the charging point's using so that the owner of the building can charge my customer back for the electricity that's used. So that's the whole idea behind this. And it's literally just power in and power out basically. So that's fairly, fairly straightforward. Anyway, where was I? Installation pliers. So these are great actually. Just really good for like you know, bending over the wires to um, doubling them over or whatever. Um, cutting, stripping 1.5 cable and 2.5 cable. Well, it can do one mil as well because it goes from 0.75 to 1.5 mil. Um, yeah, they're quite, quite good, really sharp as well for the, the cutters. You can cut through 25 mil tails like butter with these. So they'd sort of a good all rounder really. Uh, so I need to get my torque screwdriver out so that I can torque these up to the correct setting. So I'll do that now. 
I'm trying to work a bit neater. I always end up with a massive mess of stuff all around me. See, this is why Chris is with me today, is he's teaching me stuff, it's not the other way around. Yeah, see the label on the front, it tells you the talk settings. <laughs> Did you know that, Chris? <laughs> yep, check all mains terminals to talk to 1.2 Nm. Ensure ribbon cable is seated properly between the unit and front cover. All cables must enter using glands of at least IP65. Um, bungs provided must be fitted to all unused fixing holes. Only use fixings provided to maintain the IP integrity. I wonder if I've got a 32mm compression gland. If we chop the wall out a little bit and then put a 32mm compression gland on the back. That would satisfy the requirement of an IP65 gland. Have a look on the back. So we're going to hardwire the CTs on these, which um, they've got three CT connections for, hot, for wired CTs. So I'm going to just connect the wires in like this with my naughty screwdriver that I took the insulation off of because I needed it to mark a hole or something. I can't remember what it was. I think it just got a bit trashed actually, the, um, the insulation on this and so I ended up just stripping it off but obviously can't use this on live wires like so and then it just plugs in like that and then what we've done to comply with the the instructions about having an IP65 gland for each cable we've done this so we've just put the compression gland in but the other way and that is there's enough space for it like that so it enables us to just seal up nicely around the cables maintaining the IP rating of the enclosure hopefully it'll tighten up enough Armeg torque screwdriver the reason I got this is because the weir uh, the weir one I have doesn't go above three newton meters and for Hager main switches you need 3.5 newton meters of torque sometimes so I just thought I'd get this I've done a review on Tools for Sparks about it I don't know if it's come out yet or not but head over to my Tools for Sparks channel and check that out if you haven't done so already because there will be a video about this coming soon and to adjust the torque all you do is put this adjustment device in there and then turn it so I need 1.2 I believe so we just go down to 1.2 there, which is quite low actually. Oh, maybe I, maybe they've already been pre-tightened and I need to loosen them to get the wires in behind. Yeah, they're those kind of sliding terminals that if you're not careful, you can end up putting the wire behind the, behind the lug rather than in front of it. Yeah, that's better. I reckon we just need to do a 20mm hole in the back here and with a grommet and then just put that over and then just run the armour straight out of the top and then that cable can just go in underneath and then it looks like that's the bit that I'm not sure about because that may be for an external CT or something if in doubt read the instructions um, yeah it's just literally like live in live out neutral in neutral out isn't it so this kilowatt hour setting is maybe for like an external display or a counter or something like it gives a little pulse mm. i think it probably pulses up every time a The armor slice tool, the blade on it has kind of gone out of place a little bit and I need to 
I need to rejig it, but um, yeah, it does have spare blades, but I've, I just need to like take the old blade out and then put a new blade in and put it in the right place. They tend to slip a little bit after a while. And actually this is like just as quick really anyway. If you're doing loads of them, I think it's worth to have the armor size tool, but the only annoying thing about doing it this way is that sometimes if you miss just like one strand, then you have to cut it with side cutters afterwards and it never quite fits in properly. Someone asked about these, like, can you get replacement blades for them? Because presumably after a while they will get blunt. But I don't actually know if you can or if you just have to buy a whole new tool. I mean, so far I've had this for a few months and it's still very sharp, but I guess at some point they will get blunt and then you'll need to get new blades. It must be possible to get new blades, I guess, but not quite sure how easy they are to fit. Must have terminated so much steel wire armoured on YouTube now. It's just ridiculous. You know, my first ever steel wire armoured, I terminated. It was on a garden lighting job. It was my grandpa who taught me how to do it. Because my grandpa's an electrician as well. I mean, he was. He's, he's, eight, he's 85 now, but... Um, yeah, he taught me to terminate my first ever steel wire armoured when I was on school holidays. On a, I think it was just like a 2.5, 3 core or something. But I always remember that for some reason, it stuck with me. My first ever electrical training. He took great pride in teaching me how to do that. So this is the, the meter and basically you just use these terminals in the bottom so you've got live in is number one, neutral in is number three, live out is number two and neutral out is number four and it basically just reads how much power is going through it so I'm just going to connect the incoming cable and then the outgoing cable. We've got an earth bar that will go up at the top here um, which will connect the earths into. And then that's it basically, it will um, just measure how much electricity is flowing through to the charger. The Zappi charger does have its own energy monitoring within it anyway, but this is mid approved, which is like the sort of um, approval level that is needed to actually charge people for electricity. That's why we needed this particular uh, meter because the one within the Zappi, I don't think it's actually mid approved. So smart little thing really. So I'm going to put ferrules on these as well just to make it nice and neat. Right, so uh, everything's been tested. I've done R1 and R2 here. We got 0 0.03 for that. Um, We've done a ZDB test to make sure everything's okay that side, and that's fine. We've got 0 0.16, and insulation reading's okay. So now I need to do earth loop impedance here, ZS, which I'm going to just do on the terminals before I put the cover on. And we've got 0 0.18, which is pretty much perfect, as to be expected. So now what we'll do is put the cover on and then do the various actual EV charging tests. And Chris has very kindly brought his Metrel EVSE tester with him. So I'm gonna look forward to playing around with that today and see how that works. I always love it when it does that. Apparently it's the music from Zelda. I didn't know that, but that's what somebody told me in the comments on the video the other day. So, music from the computer game Zelda. I think it's like when you defeat the big boss or something, then it does that noise. Ah, interesting, the uh, grid CT has already, uh, is already reading, and it's reading 10.2 kilowatts. Right, so this is the Mitrell A1532 EVSE adapter. Very clever little bit of kit. So basically, 
it will run through the CP state, that's the communication protocol, which is basically telling the charger whether there's a vehicle connected or not. So it's on A at the moment, which is basically the EV is disconnected. If I turn it to B, then that is preparing to charge, so it says waiting for EV. If I turn it to C, then that is charging, and the Zappi will go through its process, so it does its own RCD self-check, and now it says charging. Uh, so we can then, if we want to, plug our multifunction tester in and do a no-trip RCD test and hopefully, okay, no, it's tripped because of the DC, um, so that's interesting. You have to reset it on there. Yeah, so disconnect EV, then hold menu for three seconds. Right. So I don't have six milliamp DC uh, testing on this, and I think the only one that does is the actual Matrel multifunction tester. I think that's the only tester that will will do that test at the moment. So I might need to get myself one of those at some point. I can do RCD test um, using my normal auto test function and see what that does. That should test the internal RCD at least. So half times, no trip. There we go, 140 milliseconds. It's quite high to reset it every time. So it's quite a long sort of process, really. There we go. So it should do another test now. Yeah, 150 milliseconds. Trip to type A five times. It does actually say which is quite interesting yeah so that's nice and nice and quick as it should be so this tester does have a pulsating DC RCD test so that's for testing type A RCDs so I should probably do that test as well on this but that's not testing the 6 milliamp DC protection it's still just testing I think pulsating DC 30 milliamps so we should get the same kind of readings as for the normal AC test, but it's just to make sure that it does trip with pulsating DC fault currents as well. It's interesting though that it can kind of, it seems like it can kind of tell that you're doing an RCD test because it says five times on there. That's it. So we've gone through all of those various tests, but we can't do the Z DC six milliamp. So that's the missing, missing test, really. Um, but at least we tested the functionality of the charger. Right, so the final kind of phase of setting up the Zappi, really, is just doing all the internal settings, which I want to show you. Uh, one thing somebody taught me the other day is if you tap on the casing of the Zappi, the backlight comes on, which is interesting. Um, so that's a clever little thing. But first things first, we need to do the time setting, the date and time, because you can see it's wrong here. It says it's the 26th of May. Well, it's not the 26th of May. So if we go down into other settings, time and date, then we can set the time, it's now 12.47. and the date is the 23rd of June. 2020. Date format's okay. Auto daylight savings time, yeah, that's good. Daylight savings time Britain, that's good. So we can go back there. Now, in here, while we're in this menu, there is a lock function. So if you want to, you can set a lock code. It's default 44444. Um, you can lock it so that you have to actually put in a, a pin code to make it work. So if it's in an unsecure area, that's maybe a good idea to do. Um, so the next thing we need to do is make uh, the firmware, do the firmware updates. So for that, we go to the menu and then we go to other settings, advanced, the password is default 0000, so that's fine. And then we go to... Um, I think system, yeah, download firmware. I think we have to pair it 
We have to pair it with the hub first, don't we? So it's very easy to pair it. You just press the pair button, and then it will go into pairing mode. So now we need to go to the other end and check if it's paired up. But anyway, we've got our hub now. So, oh yeah, it's lit up. It's just very bright out here, so you can't very see very well. But we've got our hub now, so that's great. So we've got to do the firmware uh, download, but I think first what we have to do is pair the hub with the app, because it's got that question mark at the moment. So now that the, um, the hub is paired with the Zappi, we can do firmware updates. So we go down to other settings, advanced, uh, system, download firmware and then basically this will download the latest firmware from oh it looks like it's already done so it, it usually will take a while and it will download the latest firmware from the hub but it looks like it's already up to date so that's good if you're not sure you can go on the my energy website and if you look at the um, the information I think it is, it'll tell you what firmware is on there and you can see on the website whether you've got the latest firmware or not. This was assembled to 26th of May so that's why it's got the latest firmware already probably. probably. Um, so then the other thing we need to do is check that the grid uh, CT is doing what it's supposed to. So if we go to other settings, advanced supply grid device so we've got um, it's on phase one which is correct phase return neutral device limit earthing setting those are all fine here we go so if we set a grid limit then this will stop the zappy from pushing the whole installation over a certain amount of amps so I will set it to 95 amps and that means that if it's charging at 32 amps but then the installation goes up to say 70 amps or 80 amps it will ramp the charger down so that it stops it from overloading the main fuse so that's important to do and I think when we, if we do CT config we can just check so there's an internal CT which is the internal load, that's fine. CT1 is set to grid which is what we want, that's why it's all working correctly. Uh, but you can reconfigure those CTs depending on which port you've connected them to. And that's pretty much it I think. So we are just about done here, the uh, lovely mini electric is now being charged as you can see. There's a little yellow flashing light on here which says that it's being charged and uh, they need to rejig the parking so they, they've just got long enough length at the moment but uh, they'll just rejig the parking a little bit this is the zappy so all up and running charging away at seven and a half kilowatts which is great so i'll show you inside what we've done so we've got our wired ct coil here which goes through the wall straight into the charger hard wired We've got our energy meter here so that the landlord can monitor the energy usage and as you can see it's already used 3 kilowatts since we connected it up because he is currently charging. Then the armoured cable runs up here with my nice firefly clips used for the first time. I did enjoy using those, I think they're very nice. Run up there and over the top and into the charging point, I mean to the DB. And then we've got our new circuit here, all labelled up, EV charger on a new 40 amp Type B circuit breaker. Uncle Phil supplied. So that's it, all ready to go and um, charging. So that's it guys, um, massive thanks to Chris here for helping me out today, really appreciate it. Chris has been the cameraman today and uh, it's been great fun working with him. The metro tester. Yeah, awesome metro tester, enjoyed using that. And behind me is his van, which I think looks pretty cool. He's got sort of my racking on order as well, so that's going to be amazing when it's done. But I just thought I'd share with you the name of his company. What is it, uh, Chris? Raisins Electrical Data Services. And what's the punchline? Your current supplier. <laughs> current <laughs> raisins. It's so cheesy, <laughs> but I love it. So thanks, Chris, and thanks everyone for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. As always, if you haven't done so already, hit the subscribe button 
and hit the notification bell and we'll see you on the next one.